Jordan has read in uh, Jonah chapter three, as well as in Jonah chapter four, <coughs> under the subject, how will your session end? We see from the scripture reading that uh, Jonah had uh, a session with the Lord. Uh, the first session is when the Lord spoke to him and called him to go to the city of Nineveh to cry out against them. And uh, the second session is when Jonah decided not to go. Uh, he went in the opposite direction and uh, a storm came upon the sea and uh, Jonah was thrown overboard by the crew and a great fish swallowed Jonah. It is inside this fish that Jonah realized he was in sin. He repented. He committed himself to God and, and the fish threw him up on the shore. Then God caused Jonah to go to Nineveh again. And Jonah does go to Nineveh. The people of Nineveh hear his preaching. They repent and God does not destroy uh, Nineveh. So the third session comes in chapter four. There we see Jonah not happy. Jonah is displeased. Jonah is angry because Jonah does not see God destroying Nineveh as Jonah thought God should have. And so this is the third session. And the question that we are faced with today is how will our session end? We don't know how the session that Jonah and God is having ended. The text does not tell us that. But we do know that we have sessions with God. We have points in our lives where we are face to face with what God has called us to do. Uh, what we are doing in reference to what God has called us to do. Our attitude toward what God has called us to do. And our acceptance or rejection of what God has called us to do. We all are face to face with a session with God from time to time. Jonah was not praying, but he had a session with God. He was not in worship but he had a session with God. He was not teaching the Ninevites the law of God, but he had a session with God. Our sessions come when we're up or when we're down, when we're happy and when we're not happy. Sometimes uh, God initiates sessions. And all the sessions that Jonah had in this uh, uh, prophecy, God initiated. God called Jonah. God prepared the fish that swallowed Jonah up. God spewed Jonah out of the fish's mouth. God called Jonah <coughs> again to go preach to Nineveh. And in chapter four, God approaches Jonah. So God initiates these sessions. And we thank God for him loving us enough. We thank God for him loving us so much. We thank God for uh, loving us uh, to the point that he wants us to have favor with him. He wants to give us eternal life with him. So these sessions come. He gives us these sessions so that we can have every opportunity possible to have favor with him and spend eternity with him. God's ultimate goal from the very beginning is for you and I to spend eternity with him. The tree of life. Man could eat of the tree and live forever. And God gave man access to the tree. So God wants us to have eternal life. Then in John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, doesn't matter what your nationality is, doesn't matter what your economic status is, no matter what your educational background is, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. God gives us all an opportunity to have favor with him. So we see Jonah in Jonah chapter four. God shows Jonah to us. And our looking at Jonah gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves, to see if we have the same things in our heart that Jonah had. And if we have the same things in our heart that Jonah had, then the question is, how will your session end? Will you yield to God? Will you reconnect with God? Will you connect with God? Or will you reject him? Will you ignore the things that you see? The question is, how will your session end? So we began to look at Jonah this morning. We went over to Jonah chapter four and verse five, and we, we saw the first attitude in his heart. Jonah chapter four and verse five, the Bible says, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. So the text says Jonah went outside of the city of Nineveh, sat down until he could see what would happen in the city. Jonah is going to sit there and see what would happen. Jonah did not plan to preach anymore. He wasn't going to teach the people how to follow God. He wasn't going to minister to them. He didn't intend to serve in any way. He wasn't going to do anything. He was just going to pull up a good seat and watch whatever was going to unfold. Jonah had adopted the role of the spectator. And we talked about being a spectator this morning. This afternoon, we're going to go a little further. We're going to go to verse number six. And there we see something else that was in Jonah's heart. The Bible says, and the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Now, after Jonah sat down and became a spectator, God planned an episode for Jonah to reveal his heart. Verse six says, the Lord appointed a plant to grow up and give Jonah shape. Verse number six, the Lord God prepared a gourd, a plant, and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow, a shade over his head. Now, notice the end of that verse. It says that Jonah was exceeding glad. In other words, Jonah was extremely happy about the gourd. He was extremely happy about the plant. The wording is so revealing. Jonah was exceeding glad. He was extremely happy about the plant. He'd been so angry. He had been so disturbed. He had been so upset by how God showed mercy on the people of Nineveh. Verse number one, we just read it. Brother Jordan just read it. Jonah was greatly displeased at how God had spared the people of Nineveh. But now Jonah was extremely happy 
exceeding glad. Why? Because now he was comfortable. Now he was in the shade. Now he's got a good seat. The spectator was comfortable. And that's what's important to the spectator, his comfort. He's not interested in what God might be doing to show mercy in people's lives. He is primarily interested in his own comfort. This is so revealing. When we are spectators, the most important thing to us is our comfort. Since we aren't really doing anything, we're just watching. We want to be comfortable while we are watching and being entertained. Think of the best sports arenas you have been in. They have comfortable seats. They have armrests on the chairs. They have cup holders and large video screens and all the food and drink you want available nearby. And the reason they have all that is because comfort is important to the spectator. That's their whole focus. They are just there to watch. So they want to be comfortable while they are watching. Now, a participant has a different mindset. Spectators in a football game only care about the comfort, the comfort of their seat. An actual player in the game isn't focused on comfort. How do you know? Well, in a football game, the player wears an uncomfortable uniform, shoulder pads, uncomfortable, very tight-fitting helmet, uncomfortable. And the list goes on. Why? Because the player's focus is not on comfort. The focus is on competing. The focus is on winning the game. It's the same with a military person. They are not focused on comfort, but on accomplishing the mission they have been given. The question that we are faced with is, is comfort a determining factor? regarding whether or not we will worship God. Remember that the Lord sees the whole of our hearts. The years ago, we didn't have the comforts we presently have. The Lord blessed us with comforts and uh, we don't want to refuse these blessings. However, use of the comforts should never outweigh our The comforts are not to be glorified. God is to be glorified. We use the comforts to glorify God, but do we, we do not glorify the comforts. We do not place the comforts over God. We're going to look at some passages of scripture. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do, we eat or drink, whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. Now, when we congregate here at the church, every time we congregate, it is not a worship service such as this setting now or the one we had this morning at 10 a.m. But whatever the setting is, we do what we do to the glory of God. So when we, when we communicate, we communicate to the glory of God. 
When we work together, we work together to the glory of God. When we plan, we plan to the glory of God. When we decide what we're going to do, we do it to the glory of God. Whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God. However we communicate, however we work, whatever we're doing, we do it to the glory of God. Meaning we want God to be visible. We want God to be beautiful. We want God to be uh, the one that individuals uh, yearn for. We want God to be attractive to individuals so individuals can say, I want to be a part of that. We do what we do to the glory of God. Everything that we do, nothing is exempt from the glory of God. And it's so important, sisters, when you come together to plan, you plan to the glory of God. Brothers, when we come together to plan, when we come together to function, whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God. We want God to be magnified. We want God to be beautified. We want God to be seen as splendid, worthwhile. Our lives are better because we're with God. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holding and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be ye not transformed. Be ye not uh, conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, that acceptable, and that perfect will of God. So, so we present ourselves. We present ourselves. When you glorify God, you present yourself. No one has to come get you. When you glorify God, you present yourself. Living sacrifice, alive, vibrant, you're not still. You're not sitting. You're not inactive. You are living, living sacrifice, holy sacrifice. And we are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. A part of our presenting ourselves, a living sacrifice, is that of our being transformed. I am to show the Lord that I'm getting better. I am to show the Lord that I am becoming more like him. I am to show the Lord that I am becoming the kind of person that he shines his light through. Now, when we talk about uh, letting our light shine, uh, Matthew chapter Five and verse 16, let your light uh, so shine that men may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So when we let our light shine, it's the Lord that puts the light in us. Our relationship with God gives us light and we allow that light to come out of us. So if the Lord cleanses you of your sins, now the question becomes, are you letting that light come forth out of you that men may see your good works? So he puts the light in you. And if it just stays in you and men do not see the light through your good works, then what Jesus says will not happen. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify the Father which is him. God does not get the glory if the light does not shine through our good works. So I've got to present myself a transformed person so that God can get the glory. And then 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, uh, Peter says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day 
of visitation. When individuals pass by this church building, whether they pass by it on a weekday or whether they pass by it on a Sunday, they ought to see living sacrifices. They ought to see good works being performed because they are not following individuals and are not following the Lord. And some individuals in not following the Lord discount the Lord. They discount his existence. They discount his power. They discount the changes he makes in people's lives. Some individuals feel like that following Jesus is really not real. Lives don't get better. You've got to have your own common sense. You don't rely on a God. But when they look at us, when they see us, when they see us getting along, when they see us loving each other, when they see the ministries we perform, when they see us faithful at worship service, they will see our good works. And then when the time comes for uh, the good works uh, to be compared to their life, God will get the glory. But now if, if the Gentiles, if those who are not following Christ cannot see anything, if they cannot see anything that we are doing, if they cannot see us doing anything, loving each other, if what they see is the opposite of what the Lord has called us to do, then God does not get any glory through that. If folk are more faithful to what they're doing than we are to the truth. God doesn't get any glory for that. That's why we've got to look at the comfort. Am I so concerned about comfort that I'm not focusing on glorifying God? I use my comforts to glorify God. I don't use my comforts to, I, I do not glorify my comforts and forget about God. Oh, Brother Fraser, that's unthinkable. Nobody does that. Yes, we do. Jonah did it in God's face. He was displeased with God dealing with the people of Nineveh uh, the way he did. And he was happy with his comfort under the shade that God provides. And there are times when we can miss church and feel good about missing church. Not thinking about the fact that when I worship, I'm giving glory and honor to God. When I'm not thinking about the fact that there are people who are not obedient to the gospel of Christ and they are more faithful to what they have obeyed than I am to the truth. We don't think about that. So, the question becomes, how, how is God being glorified? That's the question we have to ask ourselves in this session. How is God being glorified? Am I glorifying comforts or am I glorifying him? Even when we get together and we play, even when we get together and talk about things that need to be done, We've got to glorify God. Then the last and final, the last and final, verse number seven. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smoked the gold that it with. Now, now, verse seven says God appointed a worm to kill the plant. Jonah loved so much. And he did it to reveal Jonah's heart. What it revealed was that Jonah's passion was for this plant. Jonah's passion was for the comfort instead of for the people 
God had called him to minister to. These verses really do reveal the passion of Jonah's heart. Verse number six, Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. He was so happy about the comfort he got from this plant. He wasn't happy about the revival that took place in Nineveh. He wasn't happy about the repentance and the salvation of the people there. He was extremely happy about the comfort he got from the plant. And so then when God caused the worm to kill the plant, it says, the Bible says the sun beat down on Jonah and he got angry. And God asked him if he had a right to be angry in verse number nine. And Jonah says, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Angry even to death means he was really angry. That he was so angry he could die because he had lost this plan which had given him so much comfort. Jonah was passionate about this plan, which is really to say he was passionate about his own comfort. So God confronted Jonah in verse number 10. Jonah, you you had compassion on the plant, which came up overnight, perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on the, the great city, which has 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left? God was saying, Jonah, think about your heart. You are so passionate about this perishable plant just because it gives you comfort, but you don't care whether hundreds of thousands of people live or die or go to heaven or hell. So Jonah is a great example of what happens when people of God misplace the passions. It's not that they don't care about anything. They're often very passionate, but they're passionate about the wrong things. They're passionate about their own shape, passionate about their own comfort. They're passionate about the temporary things instead of being passionate about God and his mission and the people God so loves. This fourth chapter of Jonah calls for soul searching from each one of us who claim to be people of God. Have we become spectators who are only concerned about our own comforts and get more upset about when our favorite comforts are taken away than we do over the fact that people are lost, they're hurt, they're in need. Paul says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul's passion was to see people stay. He didn't care about his own comfort. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He labored in heart and, and had hardship, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, without food in the cold and, in, and, in, and, in, and exposure. But Paul was no spectator. His passion was for God and his mission and the people God wanted him to reach. And he passionately sacrificed his comfort for the sake of the mission. We don't want to be spectators. We don't want to be totally concerned about our comforts. We don't want to have misplaced passions. We want to be involved. We want to be people who glorify God. We want to be people who can see God's mission over our own comforts. How did Jonah's session end? We don't know, but we know about our session. And the message today is 
will we stop being spectators? If we are a spectator, will we stop being a spectator? You can find something to do for the Lord in the church. And we can share in the fellowship. You do what you do. And someone else does what they do. And we are doing it together as a body, even though we don't all do the same thing. Yes, we have comforts. The Lord has blessed us with comforts. The Lord has blessed us with air conditioning, comfortable seats, and carpet on the floor, and all kind of other luxuries and conveniences. But we don't allow those comforts to be glorified. We use those comforts to give glory to God. When the children of Israel, when they celebrated the Feast of Booths, they didn't go back into the wilderness. They celebrated what God did for them in the promised land, in the comforts that God gave them. But we never glorify the comfort. We glorify the God who gives us the comfort. We never allow our passion to be so great on the comforts that we don't show any passion for the mission he called us to. He was displeased with God because God saved the Nineveh, the people of Nineveh. He was happy about the plant, the gourd. When the gourd died, he was saved. Why was he saved? Because his comfort was gone. But he didn't show that same passion. He had no joy, no happiness, excuse me, for the people that God saved in them. We don't want to have misplaced passion. If you hear this evening and you want to be better for Jesus, you want your session to end, but you are have favor with God. Rededicate your life to Jesus by repentance, confession, and prayer. You're not a Christian. Become a Christian. Believe Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. The third day, the blood he shed purchased the church of God, the church of Christ. Believe that to the point that you repent, Acts 2 and verse 38. You'll confess Jesus, Acts 8, 37. We'll baptize you according to Acts 2 and verse 38. The Lord will add you to his church. Acts 2 and verse 47, he'll add you to the church of Christ. Romans 16 and verse 16. We beg you to acknowledge yourself. Do it. Do it right now. After we sing a verse of a song. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. Until I die. I will trust in the Lord, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die.